Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Facebook Live broadcast. This is Pastor Kevin Swan at Ivy Baptist Church. We're glad that you are with us tonight as we have this conversation with Congressman Bobby Scott, who is with us. He is no stranger to Ivy, uh, has been uh, faithful over the years in supporting the work. So first of all, good evening, Congressman Scott. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing fine. How are you doing, Reverend Swan? I'm, I'm doing well. As we said off camera, this is probably both of our 85th Zoom meeting today, but still, I want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule uh, to be here. And for those of you who are watching, let me also thank some people who are working very diligently behind the scenes uh, to make this happen. So I want to thank, uh, first of all, on Congressman Scott's team, uh, Miss Gigi, Miss Giselle Russell, uh, and also on our team, the Ivy staff. Uh, Miss Angie and AJ, who's still in Indiana, but still is working with us tonight, Reverend Boyer and Tim, all working behind the scenes uh, to make this work. So thank to all of you for your hard work. I do want to say that before we get started, for those who want to, we're going to have this going to be to the point that we can do it uh, as interactive as we can. There will be opportunities for you to ask questions. Uh, you can share those questions in the chat on Facebook Live, we'll have someone to try to pick those up and try to get those questions answered before we end tonight. Now, we do know that we may not be able to get to all the questions, which is okay. And we'll give you some information that'll let you know what to do uh, once this is over. So this Real Talk series, this is actually the first one that we're doing. Uh, we did some town halls uh, back in July and uh, we have launched our social justice ministry at the church. Reverend Sean Overby will be leading that. And don't forget, there is an interest meeting for the social justice ministry that will be on August the 31st. And so uh, you can get more information about that. But following the town hall meetings, we decided to continue to have the conversations that we need to have about community affairs and events. But quite frankly, I'm tired of talking. So part of this is moving from talking to action. And how do we do that? And how do we really empower you, the citizen and believer, uh, to really make change in our communities? We just saw another Black person get shot in, in Wisconsin, Jacob Blake. And so we want to make sure that we have the ability to make change. And that's what this series is all about. So having said that, I'm ready to jump in, Congressman Scott. And again, thank you uh, for being on. Now, the way I do interviews is uh, I know you like me, you're in the public eye a lot and you've been probably in the public eye a long time, but there still may be some things that people may not know about you. So let me just ask you, are you a sports well, hey, guy? There, there, there's probably a reason for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know in politics, look, in ministry too, some things you got to keep down, right? So uh, uh, do you like sports or do you like football? First of all, let me start there. You, you have a football you know, team? I don't, I don't have... Um... I don't have time to keep up with uh, football, so I usually just um, support um, Pittsburgh, whose coach went to high school in Newport News, or or um, uh, Seattle, uh, or Seattle, whose um, grandfather was the president of Norfolk State University. You know, those are the ones uh, that, that that I pick. But I usually yeah. don't have uh, usually don't have time at. I, I, I got to confess, I'm a little old to be supporting the, the um, Washington sports, Washington football team. So, so that's what I was going to ask you. You know, there's a lot of members of the church, Congressman Scott, that uh, I don't even know what to call them. They just say Washington fans, right? Well, well so, they, they did. They officially changed their name. It is Washington football team. Correct. Right now. And so I don't have, know what they're going to do when we have Jersey Day. I don't know what they're going to do. But do, do, do you go to any of the games when you're up there? Do you get a chance? And like you said, I've I know been, you've been. I've been to... Uh, and in, 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 since uh, I've been in Congress for uh, 28 years, I've been to two games. <laughs> hey, you a good man. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't go watch that team either. So, so you a good man. So, so listen, so I know you're busy all the time. I see you uh, at dinners. You're at almost every event. I think the last time I saw you, uh, I was there for Coaches for Change, and we were walking down Jefferson Avenue, and I happened to pass you. I was going back to my vehicle. You were walking down, so we know that you're out in the community. Well, there were two events the same day that day, and they right. kind of crossed. I, I ended up getting to Lincoln Park, to uh, King Lincoln Park, just as the Coaches event was ending, so they called me up to speak <laughs> as the other one was coming in, so I spoke at that one, too. Yes, yeah, so I know you, you are 
and people always call on you whenever there's an event. I know you have to go to the dinners. You got to do it. So take, take us through what would be a day for you, uh, a perfect day, where if you didn't have any of the responsibilities of being a congressman, what, how would you be relaxing and enjoying yourself? Well, you know, I, I like to play tennis, but, um, you know, a, a lot of the activities, I understand, I've been listening to the experts, tennis is, that's one of the things you could actually do yeah. because you're far enough away and it's outside. Yep. There's a big difference between doing stuff outside than inside. And we're finding this out in terms of opening schools because ventilation is so important. Yep. If you're in an enclosed space and people are breathing, this stuff gets in the air and stays there. Uh, and that's when it becomes dangerous. But if you're outside, there's not much of a problem. So tennis would be would be uh, great, but I haven't been able to uh, get back on the court. Uh, I'll, I'll try to get back on uh, soon, uh, but that that would be a, that would be a great day. That'd be a great day. Well, I tell you what, we got some we got some tennis players in the church, not pros by any stretch. But if you ever need a tennis partner, let me know and I see what we can do to try to connect that. Because have uh, days where where you have a bunch of people going out and playing. Yeah, I had to check with them and see what days they actually go out there. But there are some people in the church that do play. And, you know, this is important, Congressman Let me, Scott, let me because, know. I'd like to join them. Okay. I'll, I'll be sure to follow up with that. Good. And and I raise these questions because you, like me, because we've been in the public eye for so long, most people see us as I'm Pastor Swan. No, I'm Kevin first, right? And you're, I know people see you as Congressman Bobby Scott, but you do have a life outside of politics. And I have a life outside of ministry. And sometimes people can, can forget that. But Having said that, I do want to jump in to our discussion tonight. And you mentioned that you've been uh, in you've been engaged in politics now for how long? Well, we're ha we, we're 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 doing a taping for our annual Labor Day cookout. And um, if we were doing it in real rather than virtual, it'll be the forty fourth. Forty fourth year. Forty fourth. Forty fourth. Cookout. At the end of the first year, you're having your second. Correct. So, um, so the forty um, fourth um, cookout. So, so being 1977, in it. 1977, I was elected to the House of Delegates. So, so being in it for that long, and I'm sure you've seen a lot of change, both in D.C. and and here. What's what's been the biggest difference that you've seen, just over the years, as, as things have changed? Well, in, in, the, in, in state politics, one of the things that's changed is I got in kind of right at the end of the real end of the bird machine. Uh, it had been pretty well decimated, but it, you know, incumbents were still there. Um, and so you had a, a lot, you had, a, it was total Democratic Party control. There out of 180 were Democrats wow. in the House of Delegates. <clears throat> Five years later, I got elected to the state Senate, 32 Democratic senators out of 40. Wow. Now, um, about four or five years ago, there were only 34 um, uh, Democrats in the House. There were 80 when I was there. And now it's back up to about 53, 50, about 53. But what happened over that period of time, as the bird machine uh, dissolved, a lot of the people who were well, let's just call them conservative, um, felt uncomfortable in the Democratic Party, frankly, because we were in favor of civil rights. And we were going, and that wasn't going to change. There's nothing they could say to change it. We were in favor of civil rights. And so they kind of drifted away to where they felt more comfortable in the Republican Party. And that's really how the Southern Republican Party started by attracting people on the race issue from the Democratic Party. Um, you, you can make a good case that historically the Democratic Party left a lot to be desired because it was the party of segregation. But uh, the National Party, um, once the National Party got a fairly definitive position on civil rights after about the 1940s, a little bit, 50s, a little bit, but it was over when Goldwater ran as a Republican in 64. That was the end of the, of the um, any, any uh, 
um, uh, in any question about where people stood. Uh, after that, uh, people kind of drifted over to the uh, Republicans. There were still um, incumbents who were there, elected as Democrats, didn't change. But as they retired, um, they were replaced by Republicans. Some, a handful switched parties, but most of them just retired and were replaced slowly. It wasn't any big year. Over the course of about 15, 20 years, one or two um, you know, every, 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 every year, so that you went from 80 down to, down to in, in the low 30s. But um, uh, that, and you, you've seen that nationally, to when I got elected to Congress in 92, there was still a strong Democratic presence in the South. Um, a few years ago, there were no white Democrats anywhere in the Deep South. None. And Slowly, we're being able to pick a few seat, pick up a few seats, um, but uh, that was pretty much um, um, slowly but surely. That was that. I think that's uh, that's the most the the trend that's easiest to to see. Yeah, and I and I can appreciate that. You know, I've been in ministry for twenty three now, and and I I can I have seen how it has evolved as well. And you being in it for 44, certainly you see people come and go, but mindsets also shift and people start thinking differently. So, you know, the, the reason why, and, and we had, for those of you who don't know, we, we I asked Congressman Scott to have this dialogue because we were in a session and uh, Congressman Scott was giving this great information and sharing. And uh, it just dawned on me that perhaps some of the people didn't know how to ask questions because they weren't familiar with the process to begin with, right? I call it, I, I'm not gonna speak for y'all, I'm gonna speak for me. Maybe I was asleep in government class, right? In, in 12th grade or whatever, right? So I didn't understand the process of how government works and really the power that we have as citizens. And so I really wanna spend some time, Congressman Scott, talking about that so that those who are watching can really know how this system is set up. So. I want to start at the federal level, and we know it's federal, state, local. You're involved in the federal level, right? And I know this might sound like a civics class for a moment, but I think it's important for people to understand how it works. So there are three branches of federal government, right? Can, can you help to just explain briefly what those branches are and how they work? Well, you have the executive. Well, the first branch is the legislative branch. I'd say the first branch because it's mentioned first in the uh, Constitution, and that's uh, the House of Representatives and U.S. Senate uh, forming Congress. Um, they uh, we we make the laws. They have to if we pass a pass legislation it has to be signed by the president, or it can be can become law if it's overridden if the veto is overridden by two thirds vote in the House and the Senate. But basically, the laws are written in, in Congress. The executive branch executes, administers the laws, um, and they have a lot of discretion in how they administer the laws. Uh, but that's the executive branch. And the uh, judicial branch, headed by the Supreme Court and other federal courts, um, interpret the law. Uh, they, they decide whether laws are consistent with the Constitution. If they're not consistent, they can uh, declare them unconstitutional, uh, as the Supreme Court did in 1954. It said that all the laws <clears throat> segregating the public schools were unconstitutional uh, and set them aside. And so you have the three branches. Um, most of the um, imagination and new laws come from have come from Congress. Um, and uh, and, so, that's, and uh, so that's where you are, right? That's where and I am. so. You're in the legislative branch. So again, everybody, three branches, judicial, legislative, and executive. So for those who don't know, executive would be where the president is. Is that correct? Right. You make the laws. And then the Supreme Court would be in the judicial part of this, right? How they interpret the laws. So now let's get to your part. And by the way, if you're watching us, y'all go ahead and hit the share button and invite your family members and friends to join us and be a part of this, create a watch party. And if you do have questions that you want to ask, go ahead and hit them, uh, drop them in the chat room of Facebook. And we'll try to get them on uh, as, as we can toward the end. So uh, Congressman Scott, in your section, 
of the let you're the legislative you're the laws and so how is congress set up so people can understand that because you said earlier there are two parts to congress you have the, you have two parts the house of representatives and the uh, u.s senate uh, you have from virginia you have 11 members of the house uh, from this area i represent the third district elaine loria represents the second district uh, donald mckeechan represents the um, uh, fourth district uh, the first district um, um, uh, Rob, Rob Whitman represents this up towards the Northern Neck. Those are the districts in the, um, that cover some of uh, Hampton Roads. Um, there, are, like I said, there are 11 statewide. We have two United States Senators, Mark Warner and Tim Kaine. Um, and that's the uh, federal representation. Of course, the president and uh, vice president are elected um, state by state. And, um, and, and so we have the president, vice president, then the uh, congressional representation. Okay, so you said, basis. okay. And, and you said that legislative is the ones that make laws. So you have two parts of your, you have the house, uh, which you're in, and then you have the Senate. Can you quickly describe the differences between the two? Well, there, there are two chambers. There are slight differences in terms of power, the Senate can, the, in ratification of treaties, that's only done in the Senate. Confirmation of presidential appointments is only done in the Senate. So if a Supreme Court justice is appointed by the president subject to confirmation, the, the, contra, the confirmation will be done only in, only in the Senate. Um, uh, if it's a, um, um, a tax bill has to originate in the House. So there are slight differences, but basically, a bill to become law has to pass both the House and the Senate in the same form. Exact same bill has to pass yes. the House and the Senate. Then you send it to the president for uh, for signature or veto. If he vetoes it, we can override it with a two-third vote, House and Senate. If we don't override it, then then the president wins. It's, it's vetoed. It doesn't become law. All right. So let's give the people a common example of how all of this works. So you, you in your chamber did the coronavirus the first stimulus check, right? Is that what you all right. you all passed, right? We wrote that we wrote that bill in, in the House, the CARES Act. There were a couple of smaller bills before that, but the CARES Act was a real big one because that included the um, ex expanded and enhanced um, uh, unemployment compensation. It included the twelve hundred dollar uh, stimulus checks with five hundred dollars for the um, for dependents, the um, business loans conditioned on them keeping their employees, their payroll uh, uh, up to date. They couldn't take the money and then fire people. Right. Um, and then some, um, some other um, uh, money for uh, testing, um, things like that. Um, so that passed the House. It, was, uh, it passed the Senate and then was signed by the president. And then so people then got their, got, got their checks. So is there a second stimulus that you all are in the works of doing? Because we keep well, hearing we passed, it. We passed a, another bill very similar um, called the HEROES Act. It has the same, many of the same provisions uh, renewed, uh, particularly the um, uh, unemployment compensation and stimulus checks. But it also has a number of other provisions to help people get through the, um, uh, the, the pandemic. It's over in the Senate now, particularly one that's extremely important, and that's support for state and local government. We saw in Virginia what happened by the pandemic because the state revenues had been reforecast. Um, and the General Assembly ended just as the pandemic was starting. So all the, all the appropriations and budgeting was done without considering the pandemic. By the time you came to the regularly scheduled veto session where you consider governor's vetoes and amendments to bills, the, the, the pandemic was going strong and the revenues had been reforecast. In uh, Congress, I chair the Education and Labor Committee. So I, I looked at what happened to education in the state budget and we saw that the teacher raise, that we learned a new word, unallocated. <laughs> had been unallocated 
uh, counselors in the in the K through 12 unallocated uh, support for community colleges unallocated wow. construction at local colleges 130 million dollars at Norfolk State unallocated um, that's what will be going on all over the country if we don't come up with some money for state and local yeah okay. and I want to get to that because the, that's that's um, the next that's the next part of this right and the, so uh, that's that's part of the Heroes Act that is our next stimulus package. Okay. It's already passed the House. So we just waiting on Senate, and then it, it'll go to uh, the president's desk to either sign it or veto it, and then y'all can override it with a two thirds vote, right? Yeah, but it, that, that won't happen. It won't happen. You don't think uh, it's gonna go through? Well, I think it might go through, but if the president vetoes it, well, I don't think the president would veto it because the way the Republicans in the Senate work. They won't vote for anything until the president gives them permission. Gotcha. So if he's going to veto it, it wouldn't. Pay, it's not going to pass. Not going to pass. If, All right, sir. If, so if if it's going to pass, it's because he's going to sign it. Okay. So y'all don't hold your breath on the second one. That's what you what he's saying. Well, I'm, be... I'm surprised. I'm actually surprised that the governors aren't uh, screaming about the need for the money because they've got to balance their budgets. If they got revenue forecasts that they've got to consider. And they can only they can only um, um, balance their budget two ways: fire people, or cut contracts and let the contractor fire people. Just put people on unemployment rolls. I mean that's um, the only thing they can do. And to yeah, let because... that to let that happen just seems like the worst thing that could happen in the middle of uh, the worst unemployment we've seen in in in, in almost a hundred years. Yeah, that's a very important point because. For those who don't know, states have to balance their budget. So if you see and, all these shows. And localities. Shuffles. And yeah. localities. People so are talking you, about, people are debating defund the police. I'm surprised the mayors aren't calling their Republican senators and say, look, if we don't get this money, we're going to have to defund the police. All we got is public safety, education, and pick up the trash. Everything else is, 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 is just a small part of the budget. Yep. If we have to make so, significant significant cuts, we got to go deep in education, deep into public safety, and forget about twice a week picking up the trash. You'd be lucky to get it once a week. I'm surprised the mayors aren't yelling at this at the U.S. senators and and the and the um, and, and and the chair of the school board yelling at the U.S. senators saying we can't open the schools. It costs more money. We have things to do money to spend to get the schools ready to be safely opened. We can't Correct. do that. And, one, and, and one, one is ventilation. We talked about playing tennis outside rather than inside. Ventilation is very important. I asked for a GAO report that came out about two, two months ago that said 40% of the school districts need to make significant repairs to their HVAC system in more than half of their schools. Okay. Now, if they couldn't get them up to up to snuff uh, before the pandemic with less money, obviously those aren't going to be fixed, and those schools can't open. Well, let me say they can't open safely. They can open. They're going to close back up as soon as the people breathe on themselves. Um, they they can't open safely without more money. Now we passed an infrastructure bill that included school construction money. Um, $130 billion in school construction. That's plenty of money to fix all the ventilation systems in the school systems. All they got to do is pass it. It's sitting over in the Senate. Uh, in the uh, HEROES Act, we've got money for state and local enough so they don't have to make any cuts. And then another $100 billion for education. So all they got to do is pass that. Now, the Senate doesn't want anything for state and local. And then they have $100 billion so-called for education. But nobody apparently has, has noticed that if state and local don't get any money at the rate they're going, they're gonna cut education about 200, maybe 300 billion or more. Their 100 billion won't cover half the cuts. Whew. So so yeah, and so this this is why we're having this conversation tonight. So people can kind of understand when, when certain things happen, there's usually a, a process. There's something that, there's a chain reaction. There's some things that go on. So let me just review real quick. If you're just tuning in, we're, we're having a discussion about how government works. So right now we're at the federal level and at the federal level, there are three branches. There's the legislative branch, 
which writes and passes the laws. That's where Congressman Scott is. That's the House of Representatives and Senate. We have the executive branch, which is where the president is. And then we have the judicial branch, which is the courts and they interpret the laws. So that's the three at the highest level. And in the legislative branch, there are two chambers. There's the House of Representatives and there's the Senate. Congressman Scott is a part of the House of Representatives, not the Senate. When we get to the state level, Congressman Scott, is the state of Virginia set up very similar to the national, like you have two chambers? Most, most, state states, most states are set up almost exactly the same way. You have an executive, legislative, and judicial branch with pretty much the same powers. In, the, um, uh, with, with, in, in Virginia, we have a governor, which would represent the executive branch. We have the House of Delegates and State Senate. And then you have the um, uh, Supreme Court of Virginia and the lower courts uh, interpreting the laws. So um, it's, it's pretty much the same replicated on the state level and they consider state, state laws. Uh, the uh, federal law is the supreme law of the land. Uh, so if we pass a federal law, we can override state laws. State, states cannot override a federal law. So occasionally um, um, there are federal laws that override, um, uh, override local laws and the Supreme Court on the federal basis, that's in, go back to 1954, said you can't have, states can't have segregated schools. And right. I don't care what's in your con state constitution, no, you can't do that. And so the right. federal laws, the law, law of the land, Supreme Court is the, um, is, is the overall law, law of the land, uh, state and federal. Um, but on the state basis, everything that's not um, um, uh, decided on the federal level, the states pretty much have a free, free hand in it and they can do what they want. They appropriate money, which is um, uh, how the state um, uh, priorities get set. Um, and that's uh, legislation to, to pass a bill, pass an appropriations bill, has to pass the House Senate signed by the governor or uh, vetoed by the governor, overridden by the House and Senate. Got you. So very similar setup, right? So it's pretty much the same. Common examples. So how is it then that it's still a federal law? Let's, let's take legalization of marijuana, right? Um, so at the federal level, it's still not legal. Is that correct? But what some of the states have done is they have decriminalized, not made they it have, legal, but they decriminalized. But exactly, exactly. They can eliminate any state prohibition, but they cannot eliminate the federal pro prohibition. Now, from a, uh, what they call prosecutorial discretion point of view, most United States attorneys general um, running the FBI have decided not to enforce the federal law in states where there is no prohibition. And so in Colorado, where if there's no where there's no state prohibition, the federal government, unless there are unique circumstances, uh, will not enforce the federal prohibition against um, marijuana. But it is technically illegal, and that causes some problems. For example, banking. A bank can't do business with drug dealers. They will be co-conspirators in the drug conspiracy. And when a marijuana business that's running in the open wants to come to the bank with the money, the banks won't have anything to do with it because it's yeah. technically illegal. It's against the federal law. And so we have been trying to uh, uh, amend the banking law to allow these businesses to at least use the banks in those states where there's no st state prohibition. We haven't fixed it yet, um, but hopefully um, when we get uh, a new administration, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get that fixed. Yeah, so I wanna be clear in this particular instance, it's still a federal law against it, but what states have done is they've decriminalized it. In other words, you won't necessarily be in prison for a certain amount, but you, well, well, you 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 could be. The FBI the FBI could arrest you, but using prosecutorial discretion, 
the attorney general has directed the FBI not to use federal resources chasing down people in states where there is no state prohibition. Yes. So, yes. so, so, so it's still on the books. It's still yeah. illegal, but it's just not being enforced. Correct. So that, that's what I want to say to everybody. Decriminalization is not the same as legalization. So you got to know the terms and the differences of the terms. So, so we went to federal states are set up the same way as federal and now we get to local. And so how are local governments normally set up? All kinds of different ways. <laughs> um, most of the cities in, um, in our area are what's called um, city manager, um, are run by city managers in, as, as kind of an executive branch with the city council as a policy making legislative branch. Right. And so the, the mayor and the city council can make the laws, uh, the local laws can appropriate the money. They can appoint the city manager, but the city manager runs the city. In fact, it is most city charters and each charter may be slightly different, but most city charters prohibit members of city council uh, trying to um, uh, administer city government, uh, directing city officials to do one thing or another. They should tell the city manager what they want and the city manager will get the job done. But they shouldn't, if, if, if somebody's trash needs to be picked up, the city, the city council member ought to tell the city manager to get it done. They don't go to the Department of Sanitation and tell somebody what to do. Right. Um, now that's that's uh, that's the normal. That's what we have in most of uh, Hampton Roads. You have the, um, the the mayor, sometimes elected directly, sometimes elected by council, uh, but the council appoints a city manager who administers uh, the uh, the city. Some cities have strong mayors. Uh, Richmond has a directly elected mayor who is essentially the city manager. Oh, okay. Um, okay. And gets and gets paid like a city manager. Okay. Um, so I think this is what is important for people to understand that when it comes to local government, we we normally see the mayors, right? And we know Mayor Tuck Hampton, Mayor Price, and Newport News, but really the people who are running, I don't want to say running this, but have a larger measure of influence are the city managers, which most people may not know. And that, that's and right. Then, but but the, the, the city council makes the policy Correct. and the city manager has to follow through. Now, I, I tell you where you get some confusion is in Maryland where the county administrator, essentially the city manager, is elected. Wow. They got the same form, but separately elected. Now you got a different attitude when the council members tell you to do something when they appointed you. Right. And can and can remove you. Correct. It's different when you got yourself elected separately. Correct. And you got your ideas and uh, so that you can and that's kind of like the legislature and the governor. The governor is separately elected. Yeah. And so this is why it's important because city managers, for those of you who talk about police and all that kind of thing, the city managers are the ones that make the recommendation to the council about who to hire for the chiefs of police. And so you need to no, know No, 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 no. The city manager hires the police chief. The hires the police chief, not make the recommendation. That's right. right. So it's not the mayors, y'all. So we, we need to know that city managers do play a huge role in, in shaping our cities. So- no, 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 wait a minute, but, but the people elect the council members. So if the bad chief gets appointed, the response, isn't going to be the city manager. You ask your members of city council, what's up with this? And we're going to get you at the next election unless, unless it's fixed. And exactly then right. they tell the city manager who is subject to a 4-3 vote to be removed. Um, you tell the city manager to fix this because, um, and that's why the police, the police are political. Uh, you know, they don't, they don't fall out of the sky. Uh, Chief Drew in Newport News, Chief Sultan in, um, in, in Hampton, 
were selected through the political process. Council appointed city manager, city manager uh, picks the chief of police and he runs the, the police department. Um, if, if he's not doing a good job, the city council can direct the city manager to fix this or somebody's losing a job. It can be the police chief or it can be you. But we are not satisfied with this police, and 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 it, it it's political. I mean, Louis in, in Louisville, uh, the police shot a uh, there's a police shooting, and it looks up, none of them were wearing their body cameras. Right. Okay. Within a couple of days, the mayor fired the police chief. Okay. I will bet you they'll be wearing the body cameras and turning them on next time. Got that right. And, and all of that is the push from the citizens. And this is what we're trying to get people to understand about the power of your vote and understanding how government works. So you need to go to local city council meetings. Uh, you need to be familiar with what's being voted on. And we have the power, if we don't like something, to say to city council, if we don't like it, we will come together to vote you out. And until we understand that power, then we will, in some cases, allow things to continue in our communities. And, and so, that's, that, that's, that, that, there's, there's another point of pressure, and we have figured this out in Newport News in Hampton, and that is if there is police misconduct that is so bad that it's criminal, the Commonwealth's attorney will make that decision. Howard Gwynn in Newport News Anton Bell in Hampton, people who are elected with their base of votes in our community. Right. Uh, not totally in the community, but I mean, they ain't going anywhere if if the African American votes desert them, uh, they can't be they can't be elected. Um, yep. uh, and so when decisions are made, we may not like the decision. But I think we got good reason to believe that the right decision was made. Um, now, other areas where people don't even know who the Commonwealth's attorney is, didn't have anything to do with him being elected, when the wrong decision is made, people wonder where'd that come from? Well, a lot in a lot of cities, in Baltimore, in Chicago, in Chicago, there was a police shooting and they hid the evidence. Uh, next election, the um, what they call district attorney, we call him Commonwealth's attorney, a district attorney was voted out of office. Um, uh, and that's how you, and that's why we have to maintain, uh, you have to have an interest in who the Commonwealth attorney is. Uh, you have to have an interest in who the city council is. And then you can, then you have to tell them what you expect out of the police department. And it is, no it is no secret in Newport News and Hampton that when we were marching, Chief Drew and Chief Salt were out there marching with us. Um, Listen, it's, it's plain and simple. And, and this is what we want to get people to understand. So city council is elected by the people. The city council then tells the city manager how to go about making decisions. Now, the city manager hires chief of police, but if the city council goes to the city manager and say, hey, we like this or we don't like this, then there can be change. We also vote for the Commonwealth's attorneys. So again, this person is gonna be the person that's gonna decide whether or not, when there's a police involved shooting, whether or not they're gonna pursue criminal charges. Let me, so, tell you what, let me tell you where those elections made a difference in Minnesota. Absolutely. Keith Ellenson, used to be a good member of the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, about three years ago, he decided he wanted to run for uh, Attorney General of Minnesota. He got elected in a close election. A couple of days after the George Floyd case was floundering around, uh, they brought the guy up in charges and very, you know, anyway, he took over the prosecution. Within, a, within hours, the charges had been enhanced and the other three officers were arrested. Okay, what would have happened if he had lost that election? Elections have consequences. 
They sure do. And we can't be on the sidelines saying, Lord, have mercy. And listen, I am all for marches. I am all for protests peacefully. But if you're going to do that, then also go to the polls and exercise your right to vote. Do both to make sure that you can make sure your voice is being heard. So look, Congressman Scott, we're all, look, time is flying by, right? And I got a whole list of questions. And I know that there are some other people who have uh, shared their questions and we want you to share them on, on Facebook Live and we'll make sure that we can get them. Uh, if we can't get them answered, we'll tell you where to go to get your questions answered. So what I like to do is call this last section of time rapid fire. And, and that means we're gonna attempt, I'm gonna try to answer as many questions as we can in the period of time that we have, right? So the first question I do want to ask is that a lot of people are concerned about the, the reliability of the mail-in voting process for this upcoming election. Can you quickly speak to that? Um, starting September 18th, you can early vote. My view is that what you ought to do is just go to the registrar's office, tell him you want to early vote. It's technically absentee voting. Um, fill out the form, get the ballot, and go take three steps over to the voting machine and put it in the machine. Uh, or you gotta go to the booth, fill it out, and then put it in the machine. Over and done with. If you do it by mail, you gotta get an application, you gotta send in the application, they send you the ballot, you fill it out, you mail in the ballot. You got plenty of time for things to go wrong, so if you're gonna use the mail, make sure you do it early or you can wait till election day and vote. If you're, not if you're not registered to vote, you can go to early vote as long as it's before October 15th, which is the deadline for registration. Go to early vote, tell them you want to register, you get registered and then tell them, and now I want to vote. And you can early vote all the same time, over and done with. So yeah, make so let, sure, go ahead. Make sure you, that's the easiest thing to do just show up at the registrar's office. Now, we're trying to make sure that there won't be any lines there, but I, I suspect on the first couple of days, it may be a little overloaded uh, and we're gonna get it extra staffed, but, um, and, and the church ought to have souls to the polls. Just pick a day, Wednesday afternoon, we're gonna just march a couple of people down, maybe every Wednesday afternoon, get 40 or 50 people all at the same time and go vote. Um, um, you can vote and be finished with it. People know how they're going to vote. They may not know in the, in the first constitutional amendment, um, uh, the Democratic Party passed a resolution to oppose the first that's on redistricting. Uh, the, way it's, the way they passed it, it's just a little messed up and you don't want, and my judgment is you shouldn't put it in the constitution, messed up. Um, but no on the first constitutional amendment. There, there, there are two on there. Uh, but people know, we get that vote in for president and U.S. Senate, Mark Warner, uh, I, I forget who's, who he's running against, and the um, uh, U.S. House. Uh, people pretty, not, well, pretty well know who they're gonna be voting for. And starting September 18th, you can go right to the registrar's office and vote and be finished with it. Yeah. You don't have to wait for the mail. You don't have to wait, hope for the mail. You can vote, be finished with it. And that's the easiest thing to do. It is. And so let me give you all some dates. There's going to be a flyer at the end of this that's going to list these dates, but it's very important that you know. So as Congressman Scott said, September 18th, you can be eligible to early vote 45 days before the election. October, you said 15th, we had 13th. So somewhere in there is the, okay. we got to make sure we verify that, is the deadline to register to vote. All right. So please make sure that you have that. Um, October 31st is the last day to early vote in person, okay? If you're gonna do an absentee ballot, then you need to do it, and the deadline to apply for an absentee ballot is by October 23rd. If you're doing and the then, mail, if you're yeah, doing by the mail. mail. Right, that's for mail. And then the actual election day is November 3rd. So what Congress- I, I, think, I, think, I think you're right, it's, it's October 13th is the deadline for uh, registration. Right, so, so what Congressman Scott is saying is, if you don't trust the mail, and you don't want to go to the polls because of the virus, the best thing you can do is go to your local registrar's office. So if you look to the left of this flyer, if you live in Hampton, those are the addresses that are listed there for where you can go 
to the registrar's office and, and say, I want to, starting September 18th, I want to vote early. You go in, you do it, and you're done. You don't have to worry about the mail system. If you live in Newport News, it's on Washington Avenue. And there's a satellite office in town center. And then if you live in York County, it's 5322 George Washington Memorial Highway. So if you live in other places, just Google your local registrar's location, go there, find out when you can start voting. Again, 45 days before the election, September 18th, you can begin that. So you don't have to, you don't have to wait until November 3rd. Uh, on, the satellite office, on the satellite office in Newport News, they may not be open for early vote every day. So right. if you're not going to use the city, the city hall, if you're not using city hall, call in advance to make sure that um, uh, they're going to be open the day you want to, want to go. But um, as, as right after September 18th, right after that, just go into the registrar's office, vote, and be finished with it. Yes, and that's what I'm going to do. That's, that's what Lady Smart is going to do. We're going early. We're not going there because, you know, it's going to be long lines. And, and we want to make sure that, um, you know, so you understand that this process, you don't, you know, that I know people are being scared about the mail and all that kind of thing. You don't even have to worry about the mail if you just go to your local registrar's office beginning September the 18th. Okay. So that's the first question, Congressman Scott. Um, some other questions about, um, and again, this is rapid fire. We're trying to do these uh, so, as, as many as we can. So how, why does, what some people don't understand is the difference between electoral college and the popular vote, right? Because we know that Hillary won the popular vote, but she lost the election due to the Electoral College. So for some people who don't understand that, how does that work? Uh, basically, you get, you, win, you get score by winning a state. Uh, there are a couple of states that you, don't, you, you win by congressional district, but most of them, if you win Virginia, you get all 13 Electoral College votes. It depends on the size of the state. California, it's 50 some uh, because they're much bigger. Uh, Delaware, it's three because it's much smaller. Virginia, it's, it's 13. You got one for each representative and two for, um, uh, for, for the two senators. So your congressional representation, that's your electoral votes. You win by winning states. And, they're, uh, and that's, it's, it's like a baseball game where you win by winning games, not by running, by, by scoring, if you if you won if you lost the first game, if you won the first game ten to nothing, and lost the next three one to nothing, why didn't you win ten to four? Because right. you lost four games and that's the World Series. Well, you can technically win more votes, but if you lost more states on a weighted basis, uh, if you lost more states, it you you get credit for states. Uh, you could technically, let's turn it around, you could technically, theoretically, lose every state and still win the popular vote. If you right. lost I, I think, every state, if you lost every state by one or two votes, but you won the District of Columbia by a huge margin, you could lose every state and still win. I mean, so we, we have decided, and it's been this way through, through history, that we're going to do it on a state-by-state -state basis. Now, uh, there are some problems if you want to go to a straight popular vote. One is you couldn't possibly do a recount if it's close. Uh, you know, you got Catherine Harris in, 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 um, who was running the uh, Florida recount. If she reported some numbers you didn't believe, well, if she's in the office like that, she's probably going to, it's probably not close in Florida, so you don't have to worry about it. If you have to count those votes as part of a close election, if uh, Mississippi can do voter suppression, if, I mean, there's so many things that could happen. You don't have a national voter registration standard. Um, uh, you, you, there's so much other stuff uh, going on that people think that you would use the same strategy in an electoral college vote that you, that you um, and you just want to count the popular vote. No, you'd have a different strategy. You would, because you, what we what we see happening is you're, you're saying it's weighted, right? So that means most candidates are going to go to the states that have the most electoral college votes. Right? No, and, no, no. They're going to go to the states that are close. That are close. 
Because there's no point in going to California. Democrats are already going to win California. Right. You want to go to Ohio, where it's going to be close. Pennsylvania, where it's going to be close. Um, Michigan, where it's going to be close. You're not, you're not going to waste time in Mississippi because Democrats are going to lose Mississippi in right. Alabama. And so right. you strategically go where it's close, where you can, if you can win by 51-49 rather than lose 49-51, you can win or lose all the electoral votes. So that's going to where you're going to spend your time. If it's straight popular vote, a Democrat will go to California and try to run up the score. I got you. Uh, I got and, you. And, and, so, and so let's stop there. Let's, so there's, let's a stop there. There's, there's a different campaign, and then the question is, which one would you rather, um, which one would you rather see? But but yeah. but that's theoretical anyway. We're not going to change. Uh, it's a state by state uh, scoring. Um, and so the fact that um, if it's real close, of course, you could possibly win one and lose the other. Um, uh, anytime it's close, it could go different ways. Generally, it goes the same way, because if you're winning uh, most of the states, you're probably winning the popular vote, too. Right. And so, for, again, for those who don't know, Virginia has 13 electoral college votes. You need 270 total to win the presidential election. So please keep that number in mind. 270 is the number you have to have. So uh, we have a few questions left. And I know this question uh, may, take, may take some time because you're in the legislative branch, right? And we see all of the stuff that's happening in our country relative to black men, unarmed men. Again, we just saw Mr. Blake get shot seven times in the back. Uh, we still have not seen any justice for Breonna Taylor. Um, the Ahmaud Arbery case is still going on. So what is the feeling? The question is, what is the feeling, not just amongst Democrats, but even across the aisle about this issue? Is it still politically motivated that we see all of these things that are happening in our community, but it seems like laws or things aren't always being passed and, and people in our community don't quite understand that. Can you explain that? Well, the um, um, Congressional Black Caucus was very instrumental in drafting the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. It had a number of provisions. One, no chokeholds, no no-knock warrants, no racial profiling. It establishes national standards for things like training, implicit bias, and uh, de-escalation, and use of force why anybody thinks it's appropriate or necessary to shoot somebody in the back. I mean, that you have national standards on that. Uh, it requires collection of a lot of data. And then it makes it much easier to hold police officers accountable, civil and criminal when necessary. Uh, that bill passed the House with a nice margin and is over in the Senate. And the, frankly, the, the Republican Senate isn't gonna do anything if we want that bill passed around the country, that's my judgment, you're gonna to have to elect a Democratic Senate uh, to take up that legislation. Um, so that's what people don't understand, Congressman Scott. Is it, is it that the Republicans or the Senate won't pass it because it was a Democratic controlled House that brought it to the Senate? I mean, how, help people understand. I mean, this seems like common sense to most people. You got people getting shot and killed why wouldn't somebody want to have some sensible legislation to address this issue? Well, you'd have to ask the Republican. You know, I, I can't figure out the, the, the provisions of the legislation, no chokeholds. Who's in favor of chokeholds? Right. People are killed by chokeholds. Who's in favor of no-knock warrants where if there's a gun in the house and you go barging in somebody's house, bullets are going to be flying. I mean, who, who thinks that's a good idea? Um, Which is uh, racial, what happened with Breonna Taylor, by that's, the way. That's why that's one of the reasons it's in there. Uh, racial profiling, who thinks that's a good idea? Who's against national standards? I mean, just a little minimum national standards on things like requiring de-escalation and implicit bias training, uh, use of force, making uh, use of, uh, of, of, of uh, lethal force not reasonable but necessary. Just changing that as a national standard. And then um, collecting data so people know um, exactly what's going on and 
holding people accountable, even criminally liable. Uh, and the, the, the way the bill is written, there's nothing in there that ought to, that, that is not present law somewhere. Um, we, we change um, um, the, on criminal, whether or not the, um, um, the shooting was um, uh, willful and knowing, we change that to reckless. Well, reckless disregard is a crime already in every state. So why, you know, why, why do you have a lower, why do you need an additional standard for a police officer that shoots somebody in the, in, in, in the back? All of this, all of the provisions of this are reasonable and we can't get the Senate to take it up. Um, so, that, so that leads to my, my, I wanna, let me come back to that because that's my last question I wanna ask because we got we're almost out of time already, but, but there is a question about um, youth. We have some youth and young adults who aspire to wanna be in public service or to get into the role of politics or, or just better understand the process and, and, and make their voice be heard. What would you recommend to, to a young person at this stage that they can do to get involved? Um, get involved in organizations that are making a difference. The one I think is most appropriate in our community is NAACP. Um, when I first got back from law school, there was a, a housing issue that we got a bunch of people together and we addressed that. Then there's a health issue. We got all organized and did that. And then there was another issue uh, that we got all organized. And, and, and somebody said, you know, we need, we gotta have a permanent organization and somebody said, well, that was the NAACP. And if you look at the organization of the NAACP, they have an education committee. They have a discrimination and employment committee. They have a um, voter registration committee. They have about seven or eight committees that cover everything that could possibly come up. And people aren't satisfied with the public schools. So they would join the NAACP, get on the education committee. And when you go to the school board, instead of saying, this is what I think, you tell them, this is the position of the Newport News branch of the NAACP. I mean, nobody's going to nobody's going to take that lightly if they know what's good for them on the school board, because the NAACP is organized with a church committee that gets all the churches involved. And if something happens on the school board that the NAACP doesn't like, every church in the city or to know about it. Um, and that kind of translates into votes. And when you're talking about changing votes, uh, elected officials take note. Um, and so um, the best thing you can, and, and most branches, uh, you know, they're, they're all volunteers. They're not, not, none of them are as strong as they need to be. And you get people saying, well, they're not strong. Why, of course they're not strong. You're not involved with it. Get involved and make it stronger. Don't be sitting over there complaining, get involved. As a matter of fact, in half the branches, if you have a strong interest in doing something on education policy, making sure that there's less segregation, making sure there's lower achievement gaps, making sure there's no discrimination in uh, discipline, uh, making sure the graduation rates are what they ought to be. If, they, if you're interested in, in people getting a good education, join the NAACP, get on the education committee. Half the time you're gonna be chairman in two months. <laughs> so get, get, that's not, get, that's not like the, some of the ministries at, at the church <laughs> well tell me about it you, you know <laughs> yeah you absolutely know. so so look last last question and, and Congressman scott i would love I, I have a whole nother list of questions that i want to ask i didn't even have time to get to them because this has been a great discussion so hopefully if time permits in your schedule we could do this again but let's do but it what we, but what we really want to know what I really want to empower the people who are watching this is how, because we talked about federal, we talked about state, we talked about local, how can the average citizen be more engaged? And, and where do we go? Like, are there websites? Who do we talk to about really want, like we see the systemic racism, we see the institutional, but we see it all, but a lot of people in our community are apathetic We've had this conversation. They feel like voting doesn't matter. Nothing's going to change. How can we change that narrative? What, what are some action items we can do? 
one of the things that, you know, when I was in college, Ron Karinga, who was the motivating force in Kwanzaa, visited students. And I remember one thing he said, and that is if you want to make a difference, you can't do it as individuals. You have to do it as groups. And I know if you, you know this, if you're trying to sell a banquet, you have to sell tables. You don't sell individual seats. And if you get people selling tables, you get 30 people selling tables of 10, you have 300 people coming right off the bat. And so working in terms of groups is how you do it. And the one group, I'll go back to the NAACP. Uh, if you organize there, you can get your issues on a federal basis. The NAACP has an alert system. Um, the state is getting organized. State NAACP is getting organized. Uh, but as issues come up, the Washington Bureau will send out an alert. Here's the issue. Call your representative. By the time you've read something in the paper, they're telling you what already happened, it's too late to have an impact. Uh, they will also do a scorecard. So when, when uh, a representative comes grinning at you in your church, you can pull out the scorebook scorecard and you know who's looking at you. And some people have the nerve to come to your church and grin at you and you look up and 20 issues, NAACP had an issue and an issue on, and 18 of them were on the wrong side. That's why we don't let nobody speak anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we, we tell them now you can sit, you can praise the Lord, we'll acknowledge you, but you're not getting the mic. <laughs> well, uh, uh, but but the, the NAACP is the one, there may be, there are other organizations. If you have an interest in the environment, um, the, you have Sierra Club and groups like that that are interested. If you got, um, e each issue, there, there are recognized organizations where you can make a difference in that issue. Uh, the NAACP just covers so many, you know, education, employment discrimination, housing, um, um, so many different um, uh, issues that um, uh, it's, a nice, it's a nice place to start. But if you want to make a difference, you have to get involved in organizations. Um, and then you can you can show people that you know your views are worth listening to. Uh, some people have bright ideas, but the better more you get to know them, the less you would want them representing you anywhere. <laughs> uh, others, others, they said he, he, the person always knows what they're talking about. Um, and so when opportunities um, uh, uh, come up, uh, you you have a good idea. Uh, who to look at, but you can make you can make a a, a, a big difference um, by getting involved in organizations, uh, making sure that we channel our energy into getting out to vote, uh, because that's um, really how you get people's attentions, and that's how you make sure the right people are in there making the right decisions, particularly on city council, um, school board, and we got hard. This this um, uh, pandemic is just. It's just setting us back years. There's a thing called the summer slide where low-income students, when they leave in June, by the time they get back in September, have actually regressed about two months. Okay, the summer slide started two months early this year. And it, it, it's not gonna get better going forward unless the school board feels pressure we got to make sure the achievement gap doesn't get any worse. And even in the pandemic, you got to reduce the achievement gap. Now, unless they're getting any pressure, you know, nothing's going to happen. You get special ed students, you know, they're not getting an education. Um, they need additional support. And if there's distance learning, maybe you got to figure out a way to get a teacher to the home or something to make sure the special ed kids are getting the individual attention they need. Uh, there, there are just so many different um, um, things going on in education that without some meaningful pressure, and that's not just somebody spouting off at the mic, that's somebody having a well thought out NAACP position that will get people's attention and will convey to people that your next election may depend on how you vote on this recommendation. 
that's the pressure. That, that's where I want to end, Congressman Scott, right there. The pressure comes when we as a group of people decide that we've had enough, that we are educated on the issues. We see who's on our councils. We see who we send to the General Assembly in the state level. We see who we send to DC at the federal level. And, and we have to make sure that we understand that we as the citizens ha have the power. So I wanna, um, can y'all put the social justice slide up there for me, please? I wanna remind uh, some people that we do have an interest meeting uh, with our social justice ministry. It is going to be uh, on August the 31st. It's gonna be at uh, 7 p.m. and it's gonna be on Zoom. And there is the code there for any person of Ivy who's a member. And at some point, once we get it going, if you're not an Ivy family member, we'll still extend invitation to you. Uh, Congressman Scott mentioned a lot about the NAACP tonight. Uh, Ivy is a diamond member and supporter of the NAACP and have been for a very long time going back to my predecessor, uh, Dr. Henry Maxwell. And so uh, these are things that we do take seriously uh, when it comes to the social justice issues. Reverend Overby uh, is going to be leading that effort. So if you're interested, email socialjustice at ivybaptistchurch.org if you want to attend that meeting and you'll get some information. Socialjustice at ivybaptistchurch.org. One other slide, if you can put it up there, is we may not have been able to answer all of the questions, right? And so here's where are some numbers and websites that we want you to be mindful of uh, as we leave tonight. So the first one is the information of where you can go, okay, to follow up. If you have political questions, things about the election, things that we talked about tonight, the, the registrar's information, just basic political questions, 245-2000 is, is where you can call. If you have congressional issues, again, Congressman Scott is a part of the legislative branch that makes the laws. If you have questions regarding, he again oversees the education committee, anything re regarding education at the federal level or what's happening, congressional issues, call 380-1000. Two different numbers, y'all. Let me say it again. If you have general questions about the election, 245-2000. If you have congressional questions about what Congressman Scott does and what's being done in D.C., then you call 380-1000. And then there's a website at the bottom uh, for the State Board of Elections. So again, if you need all those dates again, or just information, if you need to verify if you're registered, go to elections.virginia.gov. Elections.virginia.gov is, is where you can get that. Congressman Scott, it has been an absolute honor. I, I really appreciate you doing this tonight. Uh, again, I would love the opportunity to do this again uh, hopefully before the election, and then we can uh, continue to educate people on this process. I'll leave it up to you if you want to make any final remarks tonight before we leave. Well, I appreciate it. And, I, you know, I was looking over your left shoulder. You got a book, Color of Law. That's it. Um, that is a um, um, interesting book because it gives a history of discrimination in housing and what the federal government did to help the segregation that deny African Americans had op opportunities that others had. And that is a contributor to the wealth disparity. And that's one of the things that um, we need to work at, um, uh, making sure that we address the wealth disparity in the country. Absolutely. And that, and that book I recommend for anybody who wants to check it out, it systematically goes through, as Congressman Scott said, how the government was complicit <laughs> in moving blacks and not allowing blacks to move in certain communities uh, to keep us in certain communities. So the value of our property would go down and other properties, uh, just all kinds of stuff that's happened over the course of our history, which again, tells us why we need to exercise our right to vote. So let me thank again, uh, Miss Gigi Russell for, for this and Congressman Scott's office. Let me thank again, Miss Angie, AJ, Tim, and Reverend Boyer on our side. Thank all of you for watching tonight. Again, we hope that you've been blessed by this. We plan to do more of these Real Talk conversations. So again, until next time, y'all be blessed. Have a great night.